Jeff, welcome to the show. Great to be here, Brendan. Thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure. I'm excited about this one. So I like to start all of my shows by asking my guests to both introduce themselves as well as provide a little bit of context on kind of who you are and uh, help us get to know you a little bit better. A lot of people know you, Jeff, but let's let's take it back to uh, to the earliest days. So over to you. Actually, what's, what's kind of weird is I started out out of college working for a uh, Oh, the oldest child care institution west of the Mississippi, a place called Safe Instant School for Boys. And it was a school for children with emotional problems. And it's funny, you know, little did I know how well that was going to prepare me for my future career. <laughs> I actually loved working with kids. It was a terrific uh, job. It led me to, uh, since I had been in the Coast Guard Reserve, I knew a little bit about organizing and the place was a mess. It was completely disorganized for a new child care worker coming in. So I offered to write a child care manual for them, which I did, um, which led me getting an offer to be the director of development for the institution and raise money for, uh, they were going through a capital campaign because they were re- rebuilding or building uh, five new cottages for these uh, children. And um, so I took point in doing that for a while, um, but I left. I left for two reasons. One is because I got into graduate school and I was uh, enrolled in a program at the University of California uh, for the School of Public Health and Hospital Administration, which I absolutely, completely, totally hated. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. And uh, at the same time that I was doing this, I was working for my brother in an enterprise called National Opinion Poll Magazine. And the idea behind it was that um, people felt somewhat disenfranchised and disconnected from the political process. So what National Opinion Poll Magazine was all about was we had bought a mini computer and we were cross-referencing um, through people's zip codes who their representatives in Congress were and who their senators were. And then we would ele- then we would find out which bills were coming up before Congress. We would write those bills up, and then we would send them out to the subscribers to the publication, and they were able to vote on the same issues that their congressmen were going to be voting on. And then they could later send a postcard that kind of is a report card to the congressman telling them about how they felt about how the congressman voted. So it's kind of a early approach at trying to revitalize democracy using some of the new tools that were available at the time it was pretty primitive. And what year was this, Jeff? This was 1976 when we got started. It lasted for about three years. And when I did that, I got a lot of media exposure. You know, I was on, never made the big shows, but um, I was on a lot of the tag, tag on shows. So I was interviewed by AM. New York, AM Washington, AM Chicago, AM Los Angeles, AM San Francisco, and then a lot of the talk shows. So there was a talk show that was big in the, on KGO in San Francisco with Jim Eason. And I became kind of his repeat, repeated guest on that show. And then I was on WHO out of Des Moines and uh, a bunch more. So I was interviewed by the Trib and um, Washington Post and a bunch of other things. So it was an interesting adventure, but it was a dismal failure. Uh, remember, I said that the initial premise behind it was that people were somewhat apathetic because of they were disenfranchised. So trying to get people energized and engaged when they're already apathetic was a dumb idea. So it was probably one of the dumbest things that we ever did, but I learned a lot. Um, unfortunately, expensive lessons for the shareholders who invested in the venture. But I learned a ton and always had a, a, a place in my heart for publishing. I thought at the time the reason the thing had failed was not because of my inexperience, which is why it failed, or because the idea itself wasn't a very good idea, which is true. I thought it was because we didn't have enough capital. So I went to work, uh, working for a company called Equitech Financial Group, who at the time was running... 10 branch uh, financial planning operations around the country. And I started out as a trainee and 
within two years, I was running the regional sales. And then eventually in three years, I was running the whole sales division, uh, running 10 different branches around the country. And my job was to recruit, hire, train, and develop uh, managers to hire, recruit, train, and develop uh, registered reps who would sell financial planning services and then implement those services. So I really started on the retail side of the business. Um, about 1984, um, they decided to close down the retail distribution side of the business. Uh, the wholesaling of our products was much more profitable um, and put the executives in different parts of the company. And I ended up being the regional vice president for institutional Realty advisors, Equitech institutional realty advisors. So I was out on the road raising money from pension funds for investment in real estate. And in those days, we consider a mega fund to be about $300 million. We couldn't understand how people could raise that much money, $300 million, and do it within an 18-month window. How, how in the world does that happen? And yet the big guys, LaSalle, you know, AEW, uh, Heitman, they were all doing it at the time. So somewhat of a puzzle. Um, we were raising like $30 million funds and struggling to do that. So I worked doing that. I was a, the top producer for our group at the time and had relationships with all over the, the Western region from, you know, Houston Municipal Employees Retirement System to Tulare County, which was one of my clients, to San Diego County, Alameda County. Um, and, you know, we were investing in real estate just like people are doing today um in 1986 um uh, i got fired and like many entrepreneurs um and i vowed i was never going to go back and work for somebody again so i was going to figure out something to do but it took me a while to figure out what i was going to do but one of the things i started to do is i started to study uh, a publication i always adored when i was raising money called institutional investor magazine and so I, I studied the history of that. And it had been started uh, a good 20 years earlier by an uh, American stock exchange stock analyst called Gil Kaplan. And Gil had a vision. And the vision was that the ownership of securities was passing from the hands of individual owners into the hands of institutions, at that time, mutual funds. And I saw the same thing going on in the real estate business. You know, the ownership of real assets and, and real estate were passing from the hands of owner operator developers into the hands of big institutional investors like CalPERS and CalSTRS, all these various entities, IBM Pension Fund, AT&T and all these. And I thought there's a need for a different kind of information, just like there was 20 years earlier. Um, all the information about real estate that was being published at the time was very transactional oriented because it was all about the brokerage industry and it was all about the developers. So who was doing what deals and how were they financing those deals? And, you know, how were they pricing those deals? And where were the deals being located? Were they successful? And that sort of thing. And, you know, the, the lead publications were National Real Estate Investor and, and uh, Real Estate Forum, probably the two of the biggest. Uh, and so I tried to get financing for what was going to be Institutional Real Estate Magazine. Again, pattern after institutional investor. And I got a, a book of venture capitalists because they didn't have online resources back in 1986, right? And uh, I went through it and I highlighted everyone that had ever done a magazine, started dialing for dollars. And three-fourths of the guys I called who had done magazines said, yeah, we did magazines, never do another one. <laughs> and the ones that did say that they did a magazine asked me two questions. They said, are you sure you have the right team? And are you sure the market is deep enough? Now, it took me a while, but that was venture capital that I didn't understand. It was a different language. What they meant was, you have the wrong team dummy, and the market's too small. Because the market was really small back then. It was like we estimated the entire market cap of the United States institutional real estate investment business to be about $90 billion. Well, there's eight companies that have more than that under management today. 
So the business has scaled dramatically since that happened. And I think we did play a role in helping the business to scale because we provided information infrastructure that, first of all, legitimized the idea of investing in real estate. Second of all, gave people information about what other people were doing in the industry so that it didn't seem so scary to an industry that generally tends to operate in kind of herd mentality because of the fiduciary rules that governed it at the time. You know, back then, the dominant providers of capital to the industry were corporate pension funds. So they were ERISA funds, right? And if you're an ERISA fund and you're considered to be a fiduciary of that ERISA fund, you can be held personally liable for any breach of fiduciary responsibility. So people took the responsibilities very seriously and they tended to move as a herd because if what 51% or better of the people were doing and you were one of them, you were pretty safe. But if you were venturing out and doing something that nobody else was doing, you were pretty exposed. So that's how the herd mentality started to develop. So Jeff, before but for our listeners who don't or who aren't familiar with what an ERISA fund is, can you just give a, a brief background on that? Yeah, in nineteen seventy four, or prior to nineteen seventy four, the mutual fund business completely blew up. And um a lot of pension funds were really having problems. CBS did a special on, you know, the pension funding crisis in America. And you remember what also had happened is that OPEC had been formed and interest rates went up to the ceiling. They went up to 13, 14, 15, 18 percent. So all these bond portfolios that these pension funds held were decimated because they were all underwritten around two and three percent. So the Department of Labor and, and, the, and the federal government passed ERISA. DOL lobbied for it and, and, uh, and Congress passed it. And it was the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974. And it laid out some rules for fiduciary behavior. And among those, it claimed that if you were advising a pension fund or a member of a pension fund staff or whatever, you were personally liable to make up for any losses and penalties associated with a breach of fiduciary responsibility. You were supposed to place the interests of the participants in the plan ahead of your own interest. And so that was the beginning of the development of what was considered to be a fiduciary mentality. Prior to that, there wasn't anything like that governing the way people were behaving. So this is 1974 when ERISA was created. And so would you say that that kind of was really the start of what is today kind of the institutional real estate industry? Was that kind of the catalyst for the evolution? It really was a catalyst that opened up real estate as an alternative asset class because one of the provisions of ERISA stated that you had to operate as a, the way a prudent person of like means and like circumstances would operate and arrange their financial affairs. Well, there weren't any guidelines for what that meant. So that meant what 51% or better of the people who are running these plans did was prudent. And one of the things that ERISA specifically stated, and a prudent person, one of the things a prudent person would do is they would diversify across asset classes to reduce the risk. And they specifically mentioned real estate as one of the asset classes that you could move into. So prior to that time, a couple of things had gone on. One is Meyer Melnikoff at, at, Prince, at uh, Prudential, which is now PGM. Uh, was an actuary, and he saw that the liabilities of pension funds were very similar to the liabilities of life companies. And so he thought life companies are backed by a lot of real estate holdings. Maybe real estate would be a good thing for pension funds. So he looked around for a vehicle that would work, and the predominant vehicle that pension funds were investing in the equities market, if they were investing in the equities market, was a mutual fund. So he crafted the very first open-end fund patterned after a mutual fund where you bought in on net asset value and bought out of net asset value just like you do in a mutual fund. And that's what really started. But it didn't gain real traction until ERISA was passed. Now diversification has been mandated. And so corporate pension funds started moving into it. Public pension funds, not so much. Public pension funds at the time 
most of them were on what you would call a legal list. So they had a charter that the state legislatures had devised a charter that said our pension fund can invest in the following kind of blue chip stocks and bonds, and that's it. So that's what they were doing. So all of a sudden, the corporate pension funds started to outstrip in terms of performance, the public pension funds, and this became a real consideration. In the state of California, Alan Emkin, who was very, very involved in democratic politics at the time and was working for Wilshire, approached Bob Twigo, who had been the uh, chief of staff for, um, um, for McCarthy, who had been the Speaker of the House. And McCarthy had just been defeated, so Bob was a free man. So he hired him to lobby for the introduction of the prudent person rule in the state of California, which meant that not only CalPERS, but CalSTRS and all the other public pension funds in California all of a sudden would begin to be able to invest and diversify their portfolios. It took a couple of years, but they finally got that done. And when that happened, um, all of a sudden, other pension public pension funds around the country started opening up. Right about that time, corporate pension funds started saying, you know, these defined pension funds are really, really expensive to, fu to, to fund, you know, because you got to make up for any losses that you incur in the portfolio because your obligation is to fund the retirement benefits of your retirees, whether or not you prudently invested the money. And any money shortfalls that you have, you have to come out of pocket, which hits profits. So one by one, the corporates started to shift from defined, contribu defined benefit to defined contribution pension plans. So as that shift took place, at the same time that the public funds were starting to come on, nobody really felt it. The industry continued to grow because the public pension funds were growing at a really fast clip. And the corporate pension funds were shutting down. So for many, many years, um, the business just continued to grow and scale to the point where it's over a $4 trillion industry today. So it grew from $90 billion to over $4 trillion in almost 40 years, not quite 40. For our listeners that aren't familiar, you mentioned defined benefit and defined contribution. Could you help us just understand, maybe compare and contrast the structural differences between these programs? Yeah, in a defined benefit plan, the corporation or the state entity that's sponsoring the plan, sometimes called the plan sponsor, is responsible for funding a certain level of benefit. So let's say, Brendan, you are going to retire. They take your last three years of earnings, your last three highest years of earnings. They'd average those. And then they'd pay you a benefit until your death um, on a monthly basis, that amount. Adjusted for cost of living. So obviously they'd need to have pretty good investment performance to be able to pay those benefits over time. If for whatever reason they weren't able to make enough money through investments to cover those liabilities, they're personally responsible, the organization, to make up the difference. So the, the cost of running these things can be very expensive, especially during downturns where you've got to go back and refund. And if you overfund the plan, you don't get the money back. So they're expensive. So what happened is about uh, 30 years ago, when they introduced a new kind of pension funding scheme called the Defined Contribution Pension Plan, corporate pension funds started closing out their defined benefit plans so that no more participants could be covered. They continued to cover the people that were in the plans. And then force the new employees to move into defined contribution. So today, 95% of all corporate pension plans are frozen. Now, public pension funds were just coming on, and um, you know they haven't had quite as much pressure. Although some public pension funds, like Alaska, Utah, and a handful of others, have frozen their defined benefit plans and now only offer defined contribution plans. In a defined contribution plan, the plan sponsor, the entity sponsoring it, is not liable to make up any losses. So a good friend of mine, Tom Mackle, who's former chair of the uh, Richmond Fed, used to call them yo-yo plans. 
because you're on your own, right? Uh, if you lose money, you, lo- you only get what's left in the account. There's nobody there to make up the difference. And for most individuals that are contributing to these plans, there's limits on how much you can contribute each year. And if you have losses, you don't get to contribute more. So it's really hard to fund a retirement out of a sole defined contribution pension plan. And yet, that is the way in which these defined contribution pension plans work. Now, it's not the same all over the globe. In Australia, um, the participation in a defined contribution plan is mandated. You you don't get a choice to opt in or opt out. Whereas in the U.S., you can participate or not participate. And also in Australia, the amount that you have to contribute is mandated. So you get to choose how much you want to contribute. In the United States, most participants under-contribute. So they under-save. So my guess is we'll have a pension funding crisis on our hands very shortly because of the defined contribution pension planning dynamics here in the U.S. And because so few people now are covered by defined benefit pension plans. You know, you are my parents, Brandon. We're all covered. But prior to them, nobody was covered. So it's a relatively new phenomenon, this whole pension funding concept. It originally was developed by Bismarck, believe it or not, in Germany. And it was done as a defensive manner to stave off the efforts of the unions. Uh, it didn't work, but um, that's when they when they first started back in the 1800s. So, so that's fascinating. And I want to, you know, so for all intents and purposes, in the institutional real estate industry from defined benefit and then on to defined contribution, um, and and now we can talk a little bit more about kind of what else it entails. It's really only existed for about 40 years. I think a lot of people, maybe, maybe, maybe you have a different view, but that's kind of my sense putting together the timeline. And, you know, it's interesting and, and maybe you can kind of tell us a little bit more about that evolution and how you've seen some of the milestones, whether it's from asset allocation at the defined contribution level, defined benefit level into real assets change. But I want to make sure you hit on one thing, because in some ways, it seems like we're kind of coming full circle. When you started IREI, you know, one of the goals was to help the transition to more institutional capital. And what you just, you know, what we were just talking about is the kind of potentially impending pension fund crisis or funding crisis. And I think the rise of opportunities for non-institutional investors, individual investors to invest in real estate at the same time is accelerating. And I'm curious to get your thought on kind of the convergence of these two trends and what that might mean for the next 40 years of our business. Well, okay. Well, first of all, let's just assume that the cow that everybody's been milking, this defined benefit pension fund cow, is starting to shrink. Now, it's shrunk way down in the corporate side. It's still growing a little bit in the public side. So it'll be around for a while. It's not going away tomorrow. But, you know, as I said, there's over eight firms that have over $90 billion under management. So companies are continuing to want to expand their asset base. And one way to do that is to move into other alternative asset classes. One place you could go would be the defined contribution pension plan market, because it's already uh, much larger, about a dollar seven for every dollar of defined benefit pension plan. Um, there's a dollar seven for con- defined contribution. So, that's a rich marketplace. Problem is, most of the people that are running those plans don't even know how to spell real estate and don't understand why real estate should be added. So there's a lot of education that needs to go along with it. And then a lot of those, the biggest plans have turned to custom target date funds, which are basically mutual fund type products that have a certain date of expiration. And you manage what they call the glide path or you manage the investment asset allocation to be very aggressive in the early days and then to get more conservative as you approach the target date. Uh, traditionally, that's been stock and bonds, period. So there are a number of firms out there that are trying to convince them to add real estate as an alternative. But the only people that really are able to be able to do that right now are people that already have open ended fund vehicles that they can create a conduit to flow the funds from the defined contribution plan into the defined, uh, into the uh, open-ended fund. And you have to invent daily pricing mechanisms and you have to create liquidity buffers and 
it's a complicated process. And so there's really only a handful of investment managers that are capable and interested in pursuing that market. For the rest of them, um, they're looking at the mass affluent and high net worth individual investor market, which as of today is about $179 trillion in capital. So it's more than four to five times larger than the defined contribution and defined benefit pension plan market combined. But it's operated pretty much for many, many years as a cottage industry with small, undercapitalized, understaffed firms that come and go. The cost of distributing into that marketplace has been very high, which means there's less money available to invest in real estate, which means that you're never going to get a market return. You're going to get a less than market return unless you use a lot of leverage and add a lot of risk to the program. And so what happens is these programs tend to go for about 10 years and they blow up. And then the advisors that are marketing them say never again. And so this cycle has been repeating itself for 40 years. Now what's happening is large institutional managers that are well-capitalized, well-staffed, good disciplines, um, much greater capabilities of execution are coming into the market, led first probably by Blackstone, but many others are moving into the market too. We count at least 30 of our traditional investment manager uh, clientele that are now developing and, and distributing product into that market. It's slow going because there's a lot of education that's also involved with it. We've actually developed a new publication platform called Real Asset Advisor to serve that side of the marketplace. And uh, it's getting good traction. So interesting developments that have occurred. Going back to the earliest days of institutional real estate, it started out really investing purely in mortgages and mostly residential mortgages that had been pooled. Then when they got the Putin person rule approved, they started to invest in real estate, but there were really only three property types. Um, there was office, and by then, at that time, office meant only CBD, brand new, AAA, trophy type office property in New York, uh, Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Dallas, handful of firms, Atlanta, and that was it. And there also was um, industrial, but that was warehouse distribution, no flex space, no life sciences, no cold storage, none of those kinds of concepts, just pure play industrial warehouse distribution. And then the third type was retail, and that, at that time it was all regional malls. So if it didn't fit into one of those three categories, it wasn't considered institutional quality real estate. You might ask, where was apartments? Apartments were considered non-institutional. Today, 40 years later, just about every type of real estate that you can possibly imagine is now fair game for institutions to invest in. So the world has changed a dramatically lot over the last 40 years in terms of what is considered to be institutional quality property. And the mentality has shifted from a focus on property attributes to cash flow sustainability. The more sustainable the cash flows, the more institutional quality the asset class. So that's how things have changed over time. And that makes sense because you're, you're, you're trying to fund pension liabilities. So the more sustainable it is me, means the less risk that it, that it brings attached to it. Having said that, opportunistic value add and other forms of, of, of real estate investing are still part of the process. But usually you, you build a core of sustainable cash flows and then you enhance the yield by adding, you know, more opportunistic or value added strategies that may be a little bit more variable in the delivery of cash flow, but give you the opportunity for higher total returns over time. And what have you observed in terms of total allocation to institutional real estate at the public pension plans? I know it's been ratcheting it up, but kind of what is that, if you zoom out and kind of go back to the beginning of, you know, the inception or the beginning of institutional real estate, what does that look like in terms of asset allocations? Well, we're going to talk about defined benefit pension plan because the allocation of defined contribution plan is now so small on the, as a percentage of the total assets that it really isn't much very countable. Um, but eventually, I think it will match defined benefits. Um, 
When I first started, allocations to real estate were around three and a half percent. Three and a quarter to three and a half percent for large pension funds. And part of the reason for that was some people had larger allocations and some people had no allocations. On, on average, it was about three and a quarter. Today, the average is closer to 10. And it varies. Sometimes it goes down to nine and eight, and sometimes it goes up above 10, not very often. But 10% tends to be um, the allocation. Now, again, it's the same story, though. Uh, it's an average. Some have higher, some have lower, and some have none. But the vast majority of large pension funds now incorporate real estate, infrastructure, and other alternatives in their asset allocation strategies. Uh, about 10 years ago, there was a, well, a little more than 10, maybe 12, 13 years ago, there was a study done by a company called Casey and Quirk called Brave New World. And it noted that we were going into a lower return environment. Now, people forget that for many, many years, you know, stocks and, and bonds were generating returns sufficient to fund pension fund liabilities. But um, total returns have dropped, and so it mandated the inclusion of alternatives to boost yield. And the study made the point that most individual investors and most institutions weren't very well equipped to move into those alternative asset classes, and so what was going to be needed was going to be a ramp up in expertise and knowledge, which has happened, and also the invention of blended products where the asset allocation was baked in. And a target date fund would be an exa a perfect example of one of those. So everything they predicted would happen has happened over the last 12 years. Kind of interesting. And that, that report, by the way, is accessible on the web if anybody's interested in getting hold of it. That's great. I think we'll try to link to that in the show notes for those of you listening. So we, so 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 here we are. What is your? This is we're recording this in January of 2024. And of what is your take on the current state of institutional real estate markets today? Well, it's a confused state. Um, if you read the papers. Every day you'll see conflicting stories. One story says it's the end of real estate. We're in a doom loop. Uh, it's never going to recover. Uh, office in particularly is dead. And then you see other stories that are quite hopeful. Boy, the, the worst is over. Denominator problems have stopped. Pension funds are going to allocate more money. You know, who's right? Who's wrong? I don't know. Um, you know, nobody knows. You kind of watch these trends unfold as they come along. We're right on the verge as we're recording this of our VIP annual uh, investor conference, and it'll be fascinating to hear what people are talking about at that conference. Um, you know, for my money, it's a cycle. You know, I saw recently a story that came out with a headline that, you know, what to do about the real estate crisis. And I'm thinking to myself, real estate crisis? It's so typical of the general press, you know, to sensationalize everything. This isn't a real estate crisis. This is a traditional real estate cycle that was exacerbated by long-term efforts of the Fed to hold down interest rates, which drove up values of any hard asset. Um, now the steam is coming out of that uh, bubble, and uh, it's riding itself, and things are repricing. I'm even seeing people, I think Ethan Penner recently came out with a notice that he and a partner are starting a new fund uh, to focus on taking advantage of office opportunities. There are a lot of people saying office is dead, but there are also an awful lot of people saying office is coming back, and this is the buying opportunity of a lifetime. We're going to be able to get buy assets that you couldn't replace for twice the money you could buy them for. I mean, they're at a 50% discount or more. So, who, again, who's right? I don't know. You know, we'll find out when we look back and see, you know, who is right, but wouldn't it be interesting if the guys that are betting on the office sector turn out to be right and make huge amounts of money out of the office sector? And we've seen this happen before. You know what the most popular off, you know, property type sector is right now? Retail. Retail. And you couldn't touch retail two years ago. You know? Um, Apartments? Apartments are interesting. They've been bulletproof for a very, very long period of time, but I'm hearing reports of uh, 
little shakiness and softness in the rental market. I uh, hadn't heard that for a long time. So maybe it's time for cyclical adjustment in apartments, but the long-term demand for apartments is still strong. So all of these asset classes go through, or our property types go through their own cycles. But even there's a, there's a university professor at University of Denver, Glenn Miller, does the real estate cycle report, shows how cyclical these various property types are over time. Interesting stuff. I think uh, only with the benefit of hindsight will we know uh, who the winners and the losers were, but uh, certainly an interesting period. One of the kind of more controversial or, or kind of charged topics that comes up is around valuations. And, uh, you know, I'm not sure kind of the, the depth of your, your expertise here, but obviously we talked about, you know, the need to create products that have the ability to price on a regular basis, whether that's daily or quarterly, that's determined by evaluation. We've got markets and a system, a valuation system that's, I think, kind of inherently challenged um, to create, you know, pricing on a, you know, regular basis based on the the lack of transactions. I, I don't want to impact your answer, but I know that, you know, in every conversation that I'm in, there's two sides to the debate, right? The valuation debate. I'm curious to get kind of your perspective broadly on valuations of institutional real estate and kind of where we are and what are some of the the challenges or opportunities that you see related to valuations and the market being unlocked. Well, whenever you get into a downturn, all of a sudden the market that appeared to be somewhat clear starts to become more opaque again, and that's where we are. Um, there's typically three different methodologies that are employed in valuing real estate. Um, one is comparable value based on transactions. When transactions slow as they have, there's less data to be able to price and mark to market. Another is replacement costs. Well, replacement costs have been going up, right, because of the cost of construction and the shortage of labor. So that's been a concern. And then you've got discounted cash flow. But depending on who you are, what kind of property type, and what you're looking at, you may actually see cash flows diminishing, in which case it's hard to get a reasonable value valuation on a shrinking cash flow. So all three measures right now aren't as reliable for coming up with meaningful, where are we in the market? And the fear that an investor has is, should I be investing at unknown valuations? How do I underwrite these deals? And then for a seller, is now the time to be selling when, when it's so, you know, opaque? Shouldn't we wait for things to turn around? Maybe the best thing to do is to just hold. And then you have to take a look at your carrying costs, which are escalating because of interest rates being higher. So it's a difficult market. Um, some people are telling me that the worst is over, that we're looking at a much brighter 2024. And other people are telling me that 2024 looks maybe even worse than 2023. That's what makes a market, different viewpoints. Who's right? We'll find out. Um, I'm in a wonderful position that I don't have to put my capital on the line every day investing in the asset class, right? Um, we just get to write about it. So we're in an enviable position. Um, doesn't mean I'm not personally invested, I am. But I'm a long-term investor and I'm a believer in cycles and I think over time it all works out. And the worst thing to do is to panic and to sell at the bottom and buy at the top, which is what 99% of people tend to do. So throughout your career, you've been a big proponent of technology uh, and specifically the, the utilization of technology in real estate. IREI has developed some interesting technology to help make, you know, create more transparency around people who are investing and what they're investing in. But as you kind of think about the evolution of the utilization of technology for institutional real estate, kind of what is your kind of take on what the next chapter of this story might look like? Well, I think there's going to be tremendous efforts made to integrate particularly the new AI technologies into real estate platforms. I've already seen some examples with some big companies that have invested quite a bit of money to get ahead of the curve 
Um, and it's pretty fascinating when you take a look at how they're able to drill down into a market using AI and differentiate properties that are side by side, which one's going to outperform the other because of certain characteristics that the AI has uncovered. And um, when they've gone back and back tested this, um, it seems to be working. Um, but so far, it's been back tested, not front tested, and we have to see how it all unfolds. My guess is they'll get better and better because they're learning. You know, they're, it's basically machine learning. Um, there's also going to be a lot more AI that's going to be introduced into client service. Um, just a simple thing. Right now, you have to go in and specify your query to get the answer that you want. You're going to be able to just speak your query, and it's going to come out. So, I mean, there's going to be a lot of things happening there. There's going to be AI and you know, used to develop better materials for building. Uh, there's going to be AI to develop better approaches to construction. Um, there's going to be AI used to improve dramatically energy utilization. Um, so, I mean, there's just no limit to the things that are going to occur. Actually, at uh, VIP, in a couple of days, the next, over the next couple of days, we've got a few sessions on AI. And uh, Chris Shada from uh, Real Foundations is going to be speaking, who's brilliant and has um, some, you know, he's touching these firms at the right point, talking to the right people who are engaged in the decisions on how to deploy. And so his insights are going to be fabulous. Um, And I'll be a lot smarter after I sit down and listen to that myself, as will the rest of the audience. Well, I'm excited to join Chris on that panel uh, in a few days. So we, uh, I also am looking forward to learning uh, from our peers about what's happening in the industry and appreciate the opportunity to, to share my thoughts uh, at VIP as well. One of the things that you and I have talked about is transparency. And, you know, you've mentioned a few terms here, how kind of real estate evolved from a cottage industry to a sophisticated asset class. We've talked about the role that technology plays in AI. We've talked about, you know, the rise of new investor types and as a result, new investment products. How does transparency, which is often a four-letter word to some, you know, kind of factor into what the expectations are for investment managers from their investors? And how has that changed over the last 40 some odd years? Well, when people think of transparency, they think of transparency in the securities market because that's their benchmark, right? And when you have a transaction occur in the securities market, either a broker or dealer transaction, um, the results go into a database that's accessible to everybody. So it's really easy to know on a day-to-day basis what the market is in that market. You may not know what direction the market's heading, Right? Could have a complete reversal or, you know, a steep glide up, upwards. You have no idea. But at least you know what the market is now. In real estate, all the information that's associated around a given transaction go into file folders or electronic digital file folders onto the desktops of the buyer, the seller, and the fa- transaction facilitators, the lawyers, the accountants, the title companies. And there it sits, unless somebody like Real Capital Analytics or CoStar comes along or Reese and says, please, sir, man, pretty please have some data. And then it has to be moved from one data repository to the other, which creates opportunity for data leakage, data corruption, data loss. So is the real estate market today a lot more transparent than it was 40 years ago? Absolutely. We've had a lot of standards introduced. We've had organizations like NACREF and MSCI and CoStar and all these various things come along that have provided a lot more data than they used to be. But is it as transparent as the securities market? No, we're in the stone age when compared to the securities market because of the way in which transactional data flies. I'm surprised that the last great financial crisis, the government didn't step in and say, every time a mortgage is given, the data has to go into a federal data bank. And every time a a borrower files a financial update, that also has to go in. 
to think that there's no way to know what the risk exposure is to the lender in the marketplace is a risk to our financial system. But for some reason, Congress didn't move in that direction. I guess it would be considered to be a little bit too socialistic. But um, something like that someday needs to occur. We need to have some way to be able to track and understand risk in the marketplace, whereas today we don't. And the data's there. It's just sitting in people's phone folder. Yeah, it's a massive opportunity for the industry. And we've seen a lot of progress over the last decade, and I think we'll continue to see progress as you know transparency moves from a nice to have to a must have and data becomes a lot more valuable for the actual owners of the data the the gp the investment manager when they can use that data to make better investment decisions to be better fiduciaries to reduce the risk of their investments the importance of having access to their own data will in, will only increase and i think that'll benefit the entirety of the market well we're closer today with companies like juniper square in existence because we have the capacity to do what we didn't have the capacity to do before. But, you know, the culture of the market hasn't changed. So I know Juniper Square takes great pride in protecting the security and the privacy of everybody who's participating and using their platform. Now, that's just the nature of the business. The culture has to decide what's more important, privacy or less systematic risk. So on that note, you've had the opportunity to work with a lot of client service professionals, people in capital raising, people in distribution, and the leadership of the firms that those individuals work for. What advice do you have for client service professionals today, kind of given the tumult of the current market environment, given the uncertainty, and given that a lot of people in our industry have not lived through a downturn in the entirety of their professional careers and they might be scratching their heads wondering what the heck am I supposed to do right now? Yeah, well, I think the, the tendency is to want to disappear. Nobody's going to be putting much money out, so let's just work on our internal workings and let's not get on the road so much. Let's not go out and bother our clients. They're busy. They're having difficulty. Besides, the conversations we're going to have with them are unpleasant and I just assume not happen. Uh, the reality of it is exactly the opposite. They should be out, have the airplane ticket, real travel, be in people's offices, not just do Zoom calls. Get out, get face to face, be with people, stand in there, and deal with the issues. You know, I've said this before, and I think some people get tired of hearing it, but you know, we all experience little losses in our life. You have to think about what's going through the mind of a plan sponsor who's trusted you to produce results. All of a sudden, you're coming back and saying the results aren't there. Sorry. What The first thing they're thinking about is, have I screwed up? Am I going to lose my job? How am I going to tell my spouse? I mean, they're having all these things. Elizabeth Kluber Ross, who wrote a book years ago called On Death and Dying, she devoted herself to studying the whole process of dying. Said we go through some very predictable emotions. The first is denial. This can't possibly be happening. The second is bargaining, right? Dear Lord, please let this cut pass from me. There's even a biblical story about it. The third is anger when the bargaining doesn't work. And the fourth is depression when you realize that anger doesn't work either. And finally, it comes down to acceptance. And this happens in all areas of our life. You know, if I lose my keys, it's like, oh, I can't believe I've lost my keys. Kids, kids, I'll give you 10 bucks if you can find my keys. God damn, son of a bitch, I've lost my keys. I've really lost them. God, I really have lost them. They're gone. Guess I better get down to the locksmith and get them changed. <laughs> we go through this in every aspect of our lives and don't even notice it. That's what investors are going to be going through this year as they're dealing with loss. And the key thing, that the instinct, the natural human thing is, Get in, give the message, get out. It's exactly the opposite of what you should do. You should get in, stand there, and deal with the issue. Same thing happens in your personal life. You know, you're having a, 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 a brew out with your spouse. Things get certain hot, and you just say, screw it, and leave. Go cool off. It's the wrong thing to do. You need to stand in there. 
and be there and show concern. And show concern. The other thing people are doing right now is they're cutting their marketing budget, which is done. Uh, you don't want to become more invisible during a time when your competitors are becoming more invisible. Now you're going to get a bigger bang for your buck for every dollar you spend because your competitors are doing just what you shouldn't be doing, becoming invisible. Right? And the ones that stay and maintain visibility and stay in and hold the hands of their clients will emerge taking market share from the ones that don't. How do I know this? Because I've been through several cycles and watched this movie over and over again. You know, when Janet Lay steps into the shower in the movie Psycho, you don't have to scratch your head. If you've seen it once, what's going to happen next? Huh. I think that's a very fair point uh, and, and one that I hope our listeners take to note as well. While we have a few more minutes left, I just wanted to get your take. As you look into your crystal ball, let's fast forward 40 years from now. What do you think institutional real estate or institutional quality real estate or even real estate will mean to financial markets? 40 years from now, I'll be 110. So it's hard for me to think in those terms. But, you know, look, commercial real estate has been, is now, it hasn't really changed much. If you stop and think about it, the basic fundamental nature of shelter hasn't changed much. You know, it's gotten a little bit more evolved in systems with electrical systems and plumbing systems and things of that nature. But four walls, a floor, and a roof haven't changed much in two, three thousand, four thousand, maybe even ten thousand. Um, the basic need for shelter is going to continue to on 40 years from now. And I think real estate will become much more of a component of individual investors' portfolios um, and will continue to be much more of a component of institutional investors' portfolios. And I also think great strides will be made um, in increasing transparency. And I think AI is going to have a lot to do with that. It has to. And the more transparent, the larger the market. The less transparent, the smaller the market. That's the price you pay. The, the price you pay for less transparency is it's easier to find opportunities, right? If you, if you work hard and dig. Um, but the price that you pay is there's less money to fund them. So more transparency means opportunities are harder to find. They're still there, but they're harder to find. And, um, more money. So since money is the lifeblood of the business, I think it has to move towards greater transparency. And in fact, it has been moving towards greater transparency for the last 40 years. I think that'll continue as well. Um, that's interesting. So, you know, as the, as the founder and, and chairman of IREI, you know, what are your kind of plans for the next, you know, five to 10 years of the organization? And what do you hope kind of the legacy of IREI will continue to be or evolve to become for our industry? Because as you know, Jeff, you've been credited by many people as being kind of the creator, if you will, or a major influential factor in the creation of the institutional real estate industry because of the work that IREI has done to bring the industry together to produce and publish unique insights and information and share best practices so that we can all learn and grow. Well, I think, I think we've been a catalyst. I don't think we've been a creator. The creator are our clients. They're the investment managers and the pension funds, and the endowments, and the foundations, and so on. They created the industry. We've been an enabler. We've helped make that happen. I kind of lost the train of thought. What was the, what was the question again, Brandon? I'm sorry. What do, you, um, what do you hope that IREI will become or focus on over the next kind of five to 10 years as we work through this current cycle? Well, a couple of things. One is um, our publications in Europe and in Asia Pacific, I'd like to see them have the same impact in those regions that we currently have in the U.S., meaning that more and more institutions are reading them, more and more institutions are attending our events. Um, we're really investor-focused. That's everything. Our whole philosophy is based on if you take care of the hearts and minds of the people with the money, the hearts and minds of the people who want access to the money will follow. So that's 
that's my hope, and that's what we're working hard to do. It's a matter of continuing to expand our relationships with investors. If we have great relationships with investors, we'll have great relationships with investment managers. Um, another thing I would like to see occur is I would like to see IREIQ, our database, become the premier database in the industry. Uh, I think the only way that that's going to happen is if we partner with our subscribers to help us do a better job of creating data. Because the problem with all databases is there's just too many data fields to be able to maintain. You know, I count in IREIQ 33,000 records right now, as of today, um, times an average of 35 fields per record. There's over 1,155,000 fields to maintain. I don't care how many people you throw at it, you're not going to be able to maintain that data. So we're enlisting our subscribers to help partner with us to tell us which fields need attention. We're really looking to partner with our subscribers to help let us know which fields, which records really need attention so that we're not paying equal attention to 33,000 records. We're really focusing on the records that people are accessing the most. And if we can do that and we can get our subscribers engaged, I think we have the opportunity to become the premier database in the industry with the very best data. Already our features are equivalent to everybody else that's out there in the market competing with us in, in the marketplace. Our interface is simpler, easier to use, more intuitive. Um, we have a couple of features that nobody else has. And um, we're less expensive. And the reason we can be less expensive is because the sponsors who underwrite our publications and our platforms are also helping underwrite the cost of running the database. So we can charge orders of magnitude less than other people charge and still operate effectively. So that's, I think, our huge opportunity, folks. And then finally, the last one is our Real Asset Advisor publication, which is created for the private wealth advisory marketplace. We launched that in 2014, and we had we were almost on target, but slightly off. We were off target because we were we made our controlled circulation or free to qualified um, private wealth advisors, the people that actually recommend these products. What we didn't really realize at the time was that they can't recommend a product that isn't approved on their platform. So the first person we needed to get focused on was the professional at the organization is responsible for approving products for distribution on their platform. So we've gone out and we spent a ton of money and a ton of months uh, developing that list because it doesn't exist. You can't buy that list out there. You think it exists, but it doesn't. Um, and we're starting with 5,000 um, product decision makers as our core circulation, supplemented with 45,000 advisors who recommend the product. And coupled with that, we think we have a killer combination that will attract sponsorship. And I think that the private wealth advisory marketplace is the future of our industry. Again, it's $179 trillion in size and growing every day. Um, if you just put 10% of that, that's $17.9 trillion worth of capital that could be in real estate. So... To me, that's the future of the industry. It's a very interesting place. It's been terribly underserved. It's been uh, given really badly structured products. But all of that is now subject to change. And I think it's just it's gonna, the door is going to blow off. So going forward 40 years, I think people will be thinking about the pension fund market as an anachronism. And they'll be thinking about the private wealth advisory marketplace as what institutional real estate is all about. Well, on that note, Jeff, I want to thank you for a great conversation today. As always, I always enjoy it. And uh, I look forward to tracking what happens in the market over the next 40 years and uh, watching IREI's impact continue to be prevalent in the markets. Thank you.